the emotions that we feel for fictional characters, like our sadness at the death of Anna Karenina or our fear of Dracula, are sometimes held to need explanation because they violate a supposedly normal relationship between our emotions and our beliefs. In normal cases, it's claimed, our emotions for an object track our beliefs about it. When you learn that a fierce-looking dog is in fact friendly, you normally stop being afraid of it. Or suppose you believe there's been an accident and you're anxious about its victims, when you discover that the accident didn't happen, your anxiety about it goes away. As soon as you realise there's nothing to feel anxious about, you duly stop feeling anxious. Our emotions for fictional objects don't seem to follow this pattern. The belief that Anna Karenina doesn't exist, never existed, doesn't prevent us from feeling sad about her death. The belief that the figure of Dracula on the screen is an actor in front of a camera doesn't stop us being afraid of him. So how are we supposed to explain this departure from the normal rule? Why do we invest emotionally in fictional characters while believing that they don't exist? To put the point slightly differently, why do we invest emotionally in objects that we believe to be imaginary? Why doesn't the belief that an object is imaginary or non-existent cancel the emotional responses that we would have to it if it were real? For convenience, I'll call this the modern problem. Now, as you know, various solutions to the modern problem have been proposed and they're currently debated. But my aim today isn't to enter directly into this debate. Instead, I'd like to examine the supposed oddity of our emotional investment in fictional objects from a historical standpoint that seems to me to have been lost within contemporary analytical philosophy, but which flourished in 17th century Europe. The standpoint is defined by a conception of imagination, of which there are several versions, but I'm going to concentrate on the version developed by Spinoza and explore its implications for the modern problem. My aim in taking this approach isn't just to show that past philosophers have handled the modern problem in ways that diverge from our own. That's hardly surprising. Nor do I want to propose that Spinoza offers an entirely satisfying solution to the modern problem as we formulate it. His questions about our emotional responses to fictional objects overlap with ours, but they're not the same. Rather, I'll suggest that Spinoza casts light on the limitations of the modern problem by rejecting some of the main assumptions on which it rests. Now, two of these rejections are worth mentioning straight away. First, the modern problem assumes that we are dealing with agents whose emotions are normally responsive to their beliefs and who are able, at least in some cases, to distinguish real from imaginary things. It's within that context that their emotions for things that they believe to be imaginary or non-existent show up as aberrant. But in Spinoza's view, this is too advanced a place to start. Conforming to the supposedly normal practice of keeping our emotions in line with our beliefs is a complex skill that we have to acquire. Rather than simply assuming it, we need to ask what capacities it presupposes and how we develop it. A second rejection follows from the first. Once we see what the skill of keeping our emotions in line with our beliefs involves, then it becomes clear, according to Spinoza, that the modern problem rests on an incomplete understanding of that skill. Spinoza's fuller analysis of it suggests that people who are capable of keeping their emotions in line with their beliefs will also be capable of playing with that skill, so to speak, by emotionally investing in things and states of affairs that they believe to be fictional. The fact that they do this shouldn't surprise us, 
and, at least in part, the modern problem dissolves. In Spinoza's view, there's more than one explanation of the emotions we feel for fictional objects, and the differences between them are shaped by his overarching conception of our philosophical progress from what he calls imagining to reasoning. These two kinds of thinking and associated ways of life always coexist. But reasoning nevertheless gives us a distinctive set of cognitive and emotional capacities that we bring to bear on fictional objects. To capture that progression, I'll set out my argument in three stages. I'll begin by introducing the conception of imagining on which Spinoza's argument rests. And this is important because since the term imagination has shifted significantly over the past three and a half centuries, we need to clarify it. And that'll help us to grasp the starting point of Spinoza's discussion. I'll then go on to examine the kinds of emotional investment in fictional objects that are in Spinoza's view, part of the everyday way of thinking and acting that he calls imagining. And after that, I'll ask what role that kind of emotional investment plays in the more critically oriented kind of thinking that he calls reasoning or understanding. <coughs> I'll argue that Spinoza identifies different kinds of emotional investment in fictional objects, some more imaginative, some more rational. We therefore need to recognise that the modern problem can have more than one solution. OK, so that's my plan. Now let me start out by talking a little bit about Spinoza's conception of imagining, the stuff of everyday life, if you like. So imagining, as Spinoza conceives of it, is our everyday pre-philosophical way of thinking and its most basic components are what he calls ideas of the way that external things affect us. When you encounter a friend, for example, she affects you and you form an idea of her. And when that happens, you're imagining. But the idea or affection that she causes in you is a complex state, in Spinoza's view, in which your perceptions your emotional states or affects, your fantasies and your beliefs are all intermingled. So let me start by trying to unpack this complexity and show how they are connected. Now, when Spinoza talks about our ideas of the way that external things affect us, we might expect him to give priority to our sensory perceptions. The primary way of being affected by external things, we might expect him to say, is to see, hear, feel, taste or smell them. But in fact, that's not the line he takes. In his view, these ideas are primarily experiences of the way that our own levels of power are changed by our encounters with external things. And these changes in our power manifest themselves in our passions or affects. When an encounter with a thing makes us more powerful, then we experience some form of joy. When it makes us less powerful, we experience some form of sadness. So our primary experiences of our changing relationships with external things are these affective states of joy and sadness, and they're, in turn, the basis of desires and aversions. We want the things that make us joyful, and we are averse to the ones that make us sad. Now, this isn't to say that our ideas of external things <coughs> lack perceptual content. For example, when I answer the doorbell, I see my friend standing there. But as well as just perceiving her, the experience affects me with joy or gladness. Imagining certainly acquaints us with the perceptible features of things, but it's more significant from Spinoza's point of view that it is attuned to the joyfulness or sadness of our interactions with external things. Rather than just perceiving my friend, 
and then perhaps responding emotionally to the perception, my idea of her is already affected. When we imagine, our ideas blend perception and affect, giving priority to affect. It's also vital to Spinoza's account of imagining that our ideas of the ways external things affect us are not, as he says, like pictures as a panel on a panel. They don't merely record the way that things seem or appear to us. Rather, they're affirmations of what exists. So to have a joyful idea of your friend at the door is to affirm that this is how things are. To your joy, your friend is standing there. So although Spinoza doesn't employ the category of belief, his ideas, these imaginative ideas, do share one of the central features of a belief. To have an idea of a thing or a state of affairs is to affirm that it exists. When we imagine, we affirm that things are a certain way. So if we now put that point together with the last one, we can say that the ideas that constitute the process of imagining are perceptual, affective and affirmative. Things are getting more complicated. But before we turn to the role of fantasy, the last piece in this puzzle, we need to touch on two further aspects of Spinoza's philosophical position. First, our ideas of the way that things affect us don't occur in isolation. It's not as though we just have them one by one. Instead, they're embedded in a process of thought which is governed by various psychological dispositions that prompt us to connect ideas in particular ways. We organise our ideas, for example, into finely differentiated types of joy and sadness. So I can distinguish the initial joy of seeing my friend from the joy of talking to her. I can distinguish the sort of pleasure I take in talking to her from the apprehension I begin to feel when it's almost time for her to leave. Equally, the occurrence of an idea sparks off associations with other ideas as, for example, when a superficial resemblance between an old friend of mine and a stranger arouses in me a feeling of fondness for the stranger. Dispositions like that move our ideas along, constituting them into a complex process of thought that's partly conscious and largely, in Spinoza's view, unconscious. Secondly, our imaginative patterns of thought are manifestations of an overarching striving to do what Spinoza calls persevere in our being. He describes this famously as a conatus. In all our thoughts and actions, he says, we are trying to maintain ourselves as the kind of things we are. And in the human case, we do that by trying to experience joy by trying to live joyfully. We desire and we pursue joyfulness and we resist sadness. As far as we can, we cultivate relationships with other things that make us joyful and we avoid those that make us sad. Now, to some extent, these efforts are rooted in reality. For instance, we usually try to spend more time with our friends than with our enemies. But our efforts to live joyfully are also helped along by an element of fantasy. And this gets a hold, I think, in two related ways. The first of these stems from the fact that our imaginative ideas of external things and states of affairs are cobbled together from our experiences of the way that we've been affected in the past. And they're often radically incomplete. Perhaps, for example, I've been joyfully affected by a person who reminds me of my friend, but that's absolutely the limit of my experience of them. I have no idea how far they really resemble my friend. Nevertheless, wanting to experience the world joyfully, I am liable to fantasize about this stranger and form an idea of them that goes beyond my actual experience. 
Perhaps I imagine them as loving and supportive, when in fact they have a black and villainous heart. Now, fantasizing also takes hold in a second way. As we've seen, imagining gives us a rather patchy and unreliable grasp of external things, mediated by our effectively laden interpretations, uh, sorry, interactions with them. But we're nevertheless striving to relate joyfully to the world, and sometimes we do this by fantasizing not merely about the properties of external things, like the character of the stranger, but about external things themselves. In an effort to make sense of our experience and live joyfully in the light of it, we may, for example, imagine things that don't in fact exist, such as tree spirits or witches, or to cite a case that particularly interests Spinoza, an anthropomorphic god. But whether our fantasies are mundane, as when I fantasize about the stranger, or pretty florid, as when I fantasize about a goddess at my elbow, say, they're all an integral part of imagining. My idea of the goddess may be as affective and affirmative as my idea of my friend, and it may enter into exact, in exactly the same way into my train of thought. So we can see that Spinoza's conception of our everyday way of thinking rejects some of the assumptions on which the modern problem rests. Where the modern problem assumes a capacity to distinguish real from fantasized things, and a capacity to manipulate the relations between beliefs and emotions, imagining works with ideas in which perception, affect, affirmation and fantasy are not clearly separated at all. Since we affirm all our ideas as ideas of things that exist, it gives us, initially at least, no means of distinguishing fact from fiction. And since all our ideas are affective, there's no problem about why this should be true of ideas that are, in fact, ideas of non-existent things. Now, faced with this view, you are probably feeling that Spinoza is failing to make a number of vital distinctions. And of course, from our modern perspective, this is true. But I think that that response misses his point. His conception of imagining is designed to capture a pre-philosophical and indeed primitive way of thinking in which there are no clear distinctions between beliefs, emotions and fantasies, and the capacity to distinguish them hasn't yet developed. Since ideas that we would describe as fantastical don't differ in type from ideas that we would describe as realistic, and both are inherently effective, an imaginative standpoint doesn't so far give us the means even to formulate the modern problem. And in Spinoza's view, this is where we have to start. The first question we need to address is how, within the framework of imagining, we learn to distinguish fiction from reality and our emotional investment in one from our emotional investment in the other. So this brings me to the next stage of my argument. So we've seen that our basic imaginative stance is to affirm the existence of the ideas that we derive from the way external things affect us. To take an example from the ethics, the basic stance of a boy who's been told stories about a winged horse will be to affirm the horse's existence. So how does the boy ever come to recognize that winged horses don't exist? He'll only come to recognize this, Spinoza argues, when he gets other ideas that exclude the existence of the horse. Perhaps, for example, someone explains to him that winged horses are just stories, fictional. Because that idea excludes the existence of the winged horse, the argument goes, he'll cease to affirm the winged horse's existence. Now this way of putting the point suggests that one idea can, as it were, definitively rule out or exclude another, rather in a way that if you logically arrive at the conclusion that P 
then you can definitively rule out not P. Spinoza thinks th that there are cases like that, but in the imaginative realm, the process of excluding an idea or affirmation is much more complex than that logical analogy would suggest. In the imaginative realm, all our ideas are, or are derived from, ideas of the way in which particular things affect us. To rule out an affirmation of a winged horse, we therefore need to appeal to our experience and the affirmations that we've drawn from it. But no such appeal can be definitive. As Spinoza says, the affirmations that constitute our imaginative thinking can only be morally certain or highly probable. So we're looking for an idea or ideas that make the existence of a winged horse improbable enough to prevent us from affirming its existence. That's the first thing. We also need to remember that since our imaginative ideas of external things are primarily affective, the boy's idea of the winged horse will not just be like an image, it's an affirmation and it will be imbued with affect, for example, with the joy of riding on the winged horse through the skies or something like that. To exclude the existence of the winged horse is therefore also to exclude this joy. And that will run counter to our striving to make ourselves as joyful as we can. In ceasing to affirm the existence of the horse, the boy loses a particular kind of joy. And that, in Spinoza's view, is the primary obstacle to his acceptance that the winged horse is a fiction. As Spinoza emphasises in the ethics, you can only alter an affect with another affect. As long as the joy that the boy derives from, uh, from affirming the idea of the winged horse outweighs the joy of ceasing to do so, he will, in all probability, continue to affirm the existence of the horse. And until he gets some effective benefit from ceasing to affirm it, he will hang on to that idea of the horse. Whether he consistently continues to affirm it or only does so in certain contexts, the affirmation of an existing winged horse will continue to play some part in his striving to live joyfully. So let me try to sum up this stretch of argument. According to Spinoza, I've said, we recognise that the object of an idea is fictional when we recognise that its existence is ruled out by our other ideas. But as we've seen, that formulation conceals a number of complexities. When you show me that the balance of probabilities is hugely against the existence of winged horses, there is a sense in which I come to know what it is for an idea of a winged horse to be fictional. I may acknowledge, here and now, that winged horses don't exist, and that idea may recur to me from time to time. But for me to gain a more robust, as it were, working grasp of the fictionality of the winged horse, I must also give up whatever joy I take in its existence. Only when some compensating joy has been established will I be able to let go of the original affirmation and consistently treat the winged horse as a fiction. And even then, Spinoza warns, my old idea of it will not completely disappear. It'll retain some place, however marginal, in my memory, my patterns of association and the satisfactions they embody, and it may occasionally resurface. I may catch myself thinking as joyfully and vividly about riding through the skies on the back of a winged horse as I might think of galloping across the field on the back of a natural one. And that daydream may be an important source of energy and comfort. So in this analysis, Spinoza is drawing our attention to a complex middle ground between a firm commitment to reality and the wholehearted affirmation of ideas that are in fact fictions. But how important a part does this middle ground play in our imaginative thinking? Some of the joy that shapes our imaginative lives derives from having sufficiently accurate ideas of our natural environment to relate to it in ways that avoid sadness. 
but we also derive joy from living cooperatively with other people who make it possible for us to satisfy our desires and indeed make it possible for us to stay alive. Both these forms of joy are difficult to sustain. We're led astray by our imaginative tendency to make the world in our own image instead of finding out what it's like. And we tend to damage cooperative relationships by trying to pursue our own desires at the expense of the desires of other people. To succeed in living cooperatively, we need help and encouragement. And one source of help lies in the middle ground that we've just sketched, and more particularly in our emotional investments in fictions. Spinoza's deepest exploration of this middle ground does not turn, as one might expect, to romance or poetry, but rather to religion. The biblical religions, he argues, are organised around the fictional idea of an anthropomorphic God. Such a God doesn't exist, but biblical narratives in which he is represented as a legislator who rewards and punishes us can strengthen our desire to follow the message of scripture which enjoins us to obey God by living cooperatively with other people. Envisaging ourselves as subject to an anthropomorphic God can increase our determination to live cooperatively and increase the joyfulness that comes with such a way of life. Now, for people who read the Bible literally and uncomplicatedly affirm the existence of an anthropomorphic God, the issue of fiction obviously doesn't arise. They take the God of Scripture to be real. But for people whose other ideas exclude or cast doubt on the existence of such a deity, the situation is going to be more complicated. Some of them may generally affirm this God's existence and only intermittently recognise him as a fiction. But what are we to say about people who are pretty secure in their conviction that there is no anthropomorphic God whilst also finding themselves moved by the biblical narratives in which he appears. Affirming those narratives and responding effectively to the God they describe may strengthen their determination and capacity to lead a cooperative life, but is that course really available to them? To put it in terms of the modern problem, can we both believe that Anna Karenina doesn't exist and give her an effectively constructive place in our thinking. Spinoza's discussion of the religious version of this problem, the problem about the anthropomorphic gods, say, is appropriately ambivalent. At one point in the Tractatus Theologico-Politicus, the text where he discusses this problem, he suggests that we have something like a duty to discover and invest in fictions that will help us to live cooperatively. For example, by experimenting with different biblical narratives and finding out how they affect us. So you, for example, may find the book of Job deeply stirring while I'm more moved by Joshua. That's the kind of experiment that we have to perform on ourselves. To put the claim another way, we have something like a duty to cultivate the skill of setting aside our judgments about what's true in the name of sustaining a harmonious way of life. But at another point, Spinoza seems to speak against this view. If your ideas really exclude the existence of an anthropomorphic god, he suggests, then it would be a kind of laziness or hypocrisy to allow yourself to fantasise about such a deity. Now these views clearly point in opposing directions, one towards the cultivation of fantasy, the other away from it. But there is nevertheless something that they have in common. Both assume that it's possible to have an affectively laden idea of a fictional deity and use it to help one live joyfully whilst also affirming, at least some of the time, that this deity doesn't exist. And Spinoza's broader <coughs> account of religion suggests why this should be so. In our imaginative lives, 
The forms of joy that we strive for are diverse and aren't all equally focused on the pursuit of truth. In some of our thinking, the pursuit of truth may be uppermost, but we also cultivate other kinds of joy, such as the joy that we derive from living cooperatively. <coughs> In our religious lives, Spinoza argues, cooperation is our overarching goal, and truth must sometimes give way to it. Our striving to persevere in our being focuses primarily on the joy of cooperating with other people and it uses fiction to that end. So religion provides an example of a practice in which the modern problem doesn't arise. If it was that the only kind of joy that imagining allowed us was the joy of relentlessly pursuing the truth, then of course we would if we were acting properly, as it were, do our best to set aside our ideas of winged horses or anthropomorphic gods, and we would resist the effective investments in those ideas that lead us to hold on to them. We would try to solve the modern problem by excluding the emotions that we feel for fictional objects. But in fact, imagining makes space for a range of joys. One of these, of course, is the joy that we take in learning what the world is like, but another is the joy we take in living cooperatively. And sometimes, if we are to live as joyfully as possible, the latter takes priority. In practices that aim at cooperation, there is no overwhelming conceptual or moral barrier to more or less conscious emotional investments in fiction. One limitation of the modern problem is therefore its assumption that in the normal case, our emotional investment in truth always overrides our emotional investment in fiction. Spinoza's analysis of imagination suggests that this is an unduly narrow idea of normality. But the modern problem also prompts us to ask how it is possible for us to feel for people or figures who don't exist. And here too, Spinoza points towards an answer. As we've seen, imagining is grounded on our complex ideas of the way that external things affect us. And because we are always being affected in many ways by many things, imagining doesn't manifest itself in a single coherent train of thought. It's a more fragmented series of affects and affirmations that loops back on itself and draws the past and future into the present. Within this process, a particular affective affirmation may get a hold and marginalize ideas that conflict with it, but is very unlikely to exclude them completely. One can, for example, continue to affirm the joyful idea of riding a winged horse in some contexts while excluding it in others. This aspect of Spinoza's account of imagining makes the fact that we feel emotions for things we know to be fictional completely unsurprising. The modern problem presents this as a puzzle, but from Spinoza's imaginative point of view, the question is rather how we could fail to engage effectively with fictions. Insofar as I, our ideas of fictions continue to enter into our imaginative thinking and enter into our striving to live joyfully, and appear, sorry, they enter into our striving to live joyfully and appear as contributions or obstacles to joyfulness. To understand how it could be otherwise, we would need to consider what it would take to neutralize the affects around which our imaginary ideas of fictions are constituted. And here, Spinoza's conception of reasoning comes into play. So this brings me to the next stage where I'm going to shift from talking primarily about Spinoza's notion of imagining and the role of fictions in that context to see what changes, if anything, when we shift to what he describes as reasoning or understanding. Now, by contrast with imagining, reasoning focuses primarily on the pursuit of truth. In this way, it comes nearer to the perspective of the modern problem. It aims as a at a correct understanding of nature, including our human natures, 
And because that understanding is held to be supremely empowering by Spinoza, it's said to bring with it a supremely satisfying form of joy. This joy, Spinoza argues, arises from the active exercise of our rational capacities and the kinds of control that that produces. Instead of relying for our joyfulness on the way that things affect us, as we do when we imagine, reasoning allows us to take joy in our own power to understand how things affect us and to adapt ourselves accordingly. Moreover, one of the things we reason about and strive to understand is the working of imagination. Rather than simply immersing ourselves in imaginative ways of thinking, reasoning provides a critical standpoint from which we can assess it. Insofar as imagining turns out to be an obstacle to the project of furthering our understanding, then we can try to bring it under rational control. And insofar as it turns out to facilitate understanding, then we can put it to use. So what effect does reasoning have on our emotional investments in fiction? At one level, it seems to rule them out completely. The better we understand that there is no anthropomorphic God, for example, the less we'll be tempted to allow such a figure to enter into our rational thinking. More generally, the more we devote ourselves to the joy that derives from knowledge of the truth, the less interested in fictions we'll become and the less we will rely on them to sustain a joyful way of life. Spinoza doesn't contest that conclusion. The perfect philosopher he describes in the ethics is someone who puts his efforts into distinguishing true from fictional ideas and orienting his striving to live joyfully to the true ones. He wants to know what's true and he rejoices in that knowledge, and as far as he can, conforms to the norm that the modern problem assumes by making his emotions responsive to his beliefs. But despite reasoning's overwhelming orientation to the truth, it has more use for fiction than we might initially suspect. And I now want to end by, or end this bit, by talking about two uses for fiction within the realm of reasoning. One of the most important things that reasoning teaches us about ourselves is that we're not purely rational beings. We can't avoid being affected by external things and we're always in engaged in the process of imagining that we've discussed. In some respects, as we've seen, imagining is an obstacle to understanding for example, it sometimes directs us to joys that are in tension with the joyful pursuit of truth. But as Spinoza now goes on to argue, it can also facilitate reasoning. More specifically, certain kinds of fantasizing, fantasizing together with the affects they arouse, can help to foster the growth of understanding by extending our capacity to deal more rationally with external things. So why should this be? Well, understanding as Spinoza conceives of it is not just a matter of knowing what things are like, but of relating to them in ways that increase our joy. To maximize our joyfulness, we need to learn how to cope joyfully with as many things and situations as possible. We must, as Spinoza says, learn to engage actively with the world around us. And here, fantasy plays a part. Suppose, for example, to take an example of the kind that Spinoza offers us, suppose that a group of rationally inclined people have never been involved in war and want to prepare for it by learning how to behave calmly and courageously in battle rather than giving way to fear. By imagining the battlefield, imagining the affects that it will arouse in them, and imagining themselves doing the right thing in those circumstances, they set out to train themselves to cope joyfully with military conflicts. Moreover, in doing so, they may imagine a range of fictional characters, as when a novice imagines a soldier with whom he will engage in combat, 
or imagines the various women who will love him for his courage. The goal of this exercise is precisely to engage his emotions, to help him feel the joy of being courageous and the misery of cowardice, and to install those affects in his pattern of thought. According to Spinoza, the self-conscious use of fantasy for purposes such as these is a manifestation of what he calls the power of the mind. As we learn to reason, we learn to keep our affects in line with our beliefs about what exists. But reasoning brings with it the skill of self-consciously allowing ourselves to emotionally engage with fictional objects in the name of extending our understanding. People who have acquired the skill of keeping their affects in line with their rational affirmations in the way that the modern problem regards as normative will also possess the ability to deliberately combine the affective and affirmative aspects of fictional ideas in a controlled form of fantasy, and sometimes they'll have rational reasons for doing so. So, emotional investment in ideas that are known to be fictional is not completely alien to reasoning or understanding. On the contrary, Spinoza is saying, it sometimes plays a pedagogical role that dispels the supposed tension between our emotional investment in an object and our knowledge that it doesn't exist. So, here's one response to the modern problem. But Spinoza also gives fantasy a further role in reasoning about our imaginative lives, and this is the second of the two ways that I said I'd identify. As we come to understand more about ourselves, we gain a fuller sense of our limitations. Cultivating reason is indeed the most empowering way to live, but it's strenuous and it makes great demands on us. In order to pursue it effectively, we have to take account of our mental and physical limitations and be careful to avoid exhaustion. From time to time, we need to restore ourselves by stepping back from the arduous business of reasoning and giving ourselves a rest. In The Ethics, Spinoza lists some of the therapeutic pleasures that we should allow ourselves, and one of them is the theatre. This, he specifies, is one of the ways a wise man relaxes. Plays can, of course, serve the pedagogic purposes that we've just touched on by inculcating virtuous affects and strengthening our desire to live by them. Sorry about that. <laughs> but they also provide an arena in which we can give way to the imaginative pleasures of fantasizing about characters whom we know to be fictional, like religion. The theatre exemplifies the middle ground between unknowing fantasy and a clear commitment to reality in which we can give <coughs> imagination free reign. So here is another, as another respect in which even people who are primarily dedicated to the pursuit of truth have rational grounds for engaging effectively with fiction. By refreshing and stimulating us, such engagements prepare us for further reasoning and using fiction in this fashion is a further mark of the power of the mind. So where does this leave us? One of the things Spinoza's argument implies is that there's more than one solution to the modern problem. If we address it from the standpoint of imagination, then we see that it presupposes skills which, in most of us, are only intermittently in play. Even when we try to affirm the non-existence of an object, our effective investment in it often remains and blocks our capacity to exclude it from our thinking. Indeed, one could almost describe this as a norm of imaginative thinking. Insofar as we imagine, we tend to retain affective investments in ideas that we know to be fictional, so that from this point of view, the modern problem is hardly a problem at all. If we address the modern problem in the light of Spinoza's conception of understanding, the problem does indeed highlight something that can be viewed as a failure of reasoning. <coughs> our emotional investment in fiction may mark the limits of our rational capacity to keep our emotions in line with our beliefs. <coughs> 
But even in this arena, there's room for affective investment in what we know to be fictional objects. The ability to block affects for things that don't exist brings with it the further skill of engaging in controlled yet affective fantasy. We need this skill, both to cultivate our understanding and to maintain our rational capacities at their peak. So whereas the modern problem sees a tension between our commitment to truth and our emotional investment in fictions, Spinoza sees the two as mutually implicated. One skill brings the other, and both have a place in a rational way of life. So these are the main conclusions of my attempt to take Spinoza's analysis of fiction seriously and consider how it bears on the modern problem. I've suggested that from this point of view, the modern problem is not particularly puzzling. It arises from certain assumptions that in Spinoza's view, we need to modify. Whether Spinoza's position is of interest in relation to contemporary discussions of the modern problem is too large an issue to take on here, though I confess I originally thought that that's where I was heading, and I would be very interested to know what you think about it. But in the minutes remaining to me, I'd like to add a sort of coda, a further thought about the relevance of the view that I've discussed. Perhaps the most thought-provoking aspect of the argument we've traced is Spinoza's insistence on the pervasiveness of fantasy in all our thinking. Fictional objects, as he sees them, are not simply falsehoods that can or should be discarded in the face of the truth. At their most constructive, they function rather like the transitional objects theorised by Donald Winnicott, and they open out a space between fantasy and reality. According to Winnicott, you remember, very young children don't have the means to distinguish external objects from the internal objects that they imagine or fantasise. For example, a young child doesn't clearly recognise its mother figure as a separate individual who comes and goes of her own accord, but imagines her as under its own control. As children mature, they have to come to terms with the difference between inner and outer objects and learn to live with the loss of control that it involves. And one manifestation of this process, Winnicott argues, is their emotional attachment to what he calls transitional objects, like, for example, an old piece of blanket or a teddy bear. To an adult, the blanket, say, is an ordinary external object. But for the child, it is, as it were, the repository of its idea of its mother figure, an idea that isn't clearly allocated to the inner realm or the outer realm. The blanket enables the child to blur the boundary between the two realms until it's emotionally capable of firming it up, as it were. But this process of separation, of getting a clear sense of the boundary between the inner and the outer, is never complete. And in our adult lives, so Winnicott suggests, art and religion provide us with transitional objects and indeed transitional practices where the boundary between inner and outer, real and fictional, is not clearly defined. <coughs> in Spinoza's account, fictional objects function rather like the child's blanket as we make the transition from a predominantly imaginative way of life to a more rational one, we, like the child, must forego some forms of joy. At all stages, this loss arouses resistance and has to be negotiated. The child's blanket is one way of negotiating it. And in Spinoza's view, religion is another. When people put their theological doubts aside and effectively affirm the existence of an anthropomorphic god, they enter a practice that restores the joy of fantasy by creating a space in which they don't have to decide whether or not an anthropomorphic deity exists. Practices such as religion, as Spinoza conceives of them, don't need to resolve this issue. 
they're expressions of a middle ground where it's really not the right question to ask. Spinoza's view that fictional objects play different affective roles in our imaginative and rational thinking also suggests that the transitional objects em employed by adults fulfil their roles in rather different ways. In the imaginative case, the not inside, not outside character of the fictional object carries with it something of the passivity that's characteristic of imaginative thinking. Our ideas of the ways that things affect us on which imagining is based and the processes of classification and association into which they enter don't lie entirely within our control. By contrast, reasoning takes what is, as it were, the equivalent of a psychoanalytic perspective in which we know what transitional objects are and how they work. But this knowledge doesn't prevent us from employing them in our thinking. On the contrary, it shows us why we should. Thank you very much.